In the Liverpool football ground, there is a large grandstand which supporters call the Cop. Some of them call it Spian Cop. Now, if you were to ask these supporters why is it called Spian Cop, I doubt very much whether many of them could tell you. Well, I am going to tell you. That grandstand in Liverpool is named after this mountain that I've just climbed and I'm sitting on in the middle of the old British colony of Natal in South Africa. Why was a grandstand in Liverpool football ground named after a mountain in Africa? Thereby hangs a fascinating and dreadful tale. At 8.30 in the evening on the 23rd of January, 1900, 1,700 Lancashire soldiers climbed this mountain with some others, got to the top, and a large proportion of them were promptly executed. Why were they executed and who executed them? South Africa in 1899. To the south and east, British territory, the Cape and Natal. To the north, the independent Boer republics of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. These two states were formed by people of mainly Dutch and Huguenot origin. They trekked northward from the Cape to escape British rule. They are collectively known as Boers, meaning farmers. Their relationship with the British in those early days became checkered, culminating in war in 1881 and ending with a short, sharp British defeat on a mountain similar to this called Majuba. The British withdrew, the army smarting under the humiliation. Unhappily for the Boers, but to the incipient satisfaction of right-wing British political and military aspirations, at Johannesburg, the greatest gold deposit that the world has ever known was discovered. Unhappily for the Boers may seem an odd expression, but gold attracted the British and more ominously certain ambitious elements of the British ruling class. Into Johannesburg came 16,000 gold-hungry Britishers trailing imperial politics in their wake and soon demanding the vote. The president of the Transvaal, Kruger, saw the thin end of the wedge and opposed it. The British minister at the Cape, Milner, grasped this unscrupulous political opportunity, the franchise question, to force Kruger towards submission. Milner colluded with the distinguished imperialist Cecil Rhodes and war was again in the air. In May 1899, the old Puritan Kruger met the elegant Milner at Blomfontein in the last effort to avoid war. Kruger made some concessions the last words Kruger spoke directly at British imperialism were, it is my country that you want, I am not ready to hand over my country to strangers. Milner cabled his ally, the British colonial secretary Joseph Chamberlain, I should be inclined to work up to a crisis. I have no illusions about Kruger's equal determination. It means we shall have to fight. And so the British, in 1899, issued them with an ultimatum which made it imperative for those two independent republics, those two independent Boer republics, to attack the British and attack them they did. Therefore, again I submit that the reason that these Lancashire men were executed here and why that grandstand in Liverpool is called the cop was because of British greed for someone else's gold. Here the Lancashire men died, and those who returned to Liverpool watched the game, the football game, from a large mound of earth, as it was at the time, and they called it, remembering their mates up here who were dead, the cop, the spian cop. Now, if anyone wishes, has the audacity to argue with me 
about the politics of what I had said, I called to my support another Welshman, Mr. David Lloyd George, who said precisely this, while the war was being created by the British and while it was being fought, and thereby end himself persecution from a large proportion of the British people. The farmer nations of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal marshaled themselves to meet the military weight of a quarter of the Earth's surface. They took down their Mauser rifles, left their farms, and commander by commander assembled in readiness. On October 11, 1899, the war ultimatum expired with the slogan, God and the Mauser. The Boers took the initiative and poured into British territory. The thoroughfare of this British colony stretched from the port of Durban northward through Peter Maritzburg, Chivli Colenso, the Tugela River, Ladysmith, and on to the Transvaal border. The main British military position here in Natal was in this town of Ladysmith, which is uh, symbolized by the old town hall. And during the siege, the Boers fired a shell right through that clock tower. Here, at the outset of the war, there were 8,000 British soldiers, and uh, 40 miles to the north, up there at Glencoe, were another 4,000. And these were all the British soldiers that stood between uh, the Boer army and the sea at Durban. In command of the uh, army in Natal was General Sir George White, V.C. He was 64 and not very well, and someone asked him, uh, Do you feel fit enough, sir? To which the general replied, Fit enough for anything except running away. On 20th of October, just north of Glencoe, at a place called Talana Hill, the Boer army and the British army met for the first time. In this initial engagement, the British suffered 500 casualties to the Boers 150. This eventually led to a British withdrawal on Ladysmith and the Boers moved towards an investment. When the news of this ignominious British defeat reached the ears of the inhabitants of Ladysmith, there was near panic. The impossible had happened. Boers, uh, farmers, had defeated British regular soldiers. Uh, this was explained in one way by a senior British officer, General Clary, as a matter of fact. He said, uh, the worst of the Boers is that their tactics are never according to rule. We attack them in one position. When we get there, they've galloped off and are coming in on your rear, which is hardly cricket. Now, you may not believe this, but the general actually said it. The Boers surrounded Ladysmith and moved southward to the Tugela River. At this time, they were conservatively led and failed to pursue the British, perhaps to the sea. They took up formidable defensive positions along the hills on the northern banks of the Tugela. The British fell back several miles further south to Escor, thereby leaving a sort of no-man's land. The only aggressive move they made was with an armoured train that puffed belligerently and quaintly northward, full of Dublins and volunteers from Durban. A Boers patrol in the vicinity, uh, passengers understandably were nervous. On November the 15th, young Winston Churchill, who was there as a newspaper correspondent, asked if he could venture northward. Off they steamed. They observed Boers round and about, with uh, considerable trepidation. Boers opened fire. The train was hurled into reverse. The Boers had naughtily removed a portion of the track. And standing on the exact spot where the armoured train crashed, the leading truck leapt into the air and fell somewhere over there, crushing some men. The second one sleared across the embankment and turned over, again killing some men. The third, and these three were immediately in front of the locomotive, sleared across the track and blocked the way. The four guns up on the hill swerved round, and now three field, 
artillery pieces were concentrated, as well as the Maxim and the rifle fire, on the wreckage. Winston Churchill uh, put it in a typical way. He said, uh, he wrote, he wrote, we were not left long in the comparative safe and quiet of a railway accident. From the wreckage emerged two leaders. Expectedly, the commander, Captain Haldane, and unexpectedly, the newspaper man, Winston Churchill. For 80 minutes, they defended and laboured under a devastating fire. All around Churchill, men were killed, a bullet chipped his hand. Finally, a wounded Dublin pulled out his white handkerchief, and all was over. This is where the soldiers are buried. Uh, this central portion here was made at the time by the men who buried them. The lettering is picked out in British .303 ammunition, extended ammunition, and therefore probably picked up from the site of the defense of the train. It reads, erected by the border regiment in memory of our comrades who fell on November, and they weren't quite sure of the date. In actual fact, it was November the 15th. While these poor soldiers were being buried here, Winston Churchill was remonstrating with his Boer captors. He remonstrated that he was a newspaper correspondent and not a combatant. Of course, the Boers had observed him for about 80 minutes, taking a leading part in the defense of the train. They wouldn't listen to him, quite right, too. And they led him off north to Pretoria. As he was being led away with Captain Haldane, he turned to Captain Haldane and he said, uh, It's an ill wind. The publicity from this event will enable me to get into Parliament. And of course he did get into Parliament. Uh, Henry Williamson, the distinguished writer, once told me that uh, no sooner had he got into Parliament than he was involved in a debate there about whether certain Boer leaders from the Cape, rebels, should be executed. And after the elder statesmen had had their say, this brash young man, as Henry Williamson described him, got to his feet and said, the grass will grow again on the battlefield, but never on the scaffold. That's an extraordinary statement for a young man to make, so wise. Incidentally, of course, Winston Churchill, no sooner had they got him into prison at Pretoria than he escaped to Lorenzo Marx made his way right round southern Africa, back here, to join the Natal Field Force once again when they went to the relief of Ladysmith, and he was with them throughout all their major battles. Wars besieging Ladysmith had heavy guns with a range of 11,000 yards. They were called Long Toms. The British could only reply to 8,000 yards. target for the Boer gunners because they knew very well that uh, Colonel Frank Rose, the brother of Cecil, was staying here. Also staying here was a certain Dr. Stark, who was a very cautious doctor. Uh, he knew well that the uh, Boer gunners were very regular in their firing habits, uh, if in nothing else. He knew that they didn't fire before breakfast or after tea. And therefore the doctor here had a very early breakfast, had a hamper of goodies packed for him, and with his uh, pet pussycat under his arm, came out of this door early in the morning down the road and uh, went to his hole in the side of the Clip River, where he remained most of the day. Then after tea, he returned here in safety to the Royal Hotel. Unfortunately, one evening, the Boers decided to be a bit eccentric and uh, chucked over an extra shell for full measure. It hit the doctor's room up there, came down the stairway without exploding, through the hall, through the open door, and met poor Dr. Stark just here on the doorstep. It killed him, and uh, with all the research that I've been able to do, I 
can find no trace of what did happen to his pet pussycat. The British Empire marshalled its loins. A quarter of the Earth's surface turned mystically to the Queen and to the South African War. to the support of British materialism? That is the question. From the great corners of the empire, men and arms poured into ships. From Canada, Australia, New Zealand and India, they set sail for the war. The personification of this massive imperial endeavour was the newly appointed Commander-in-Chief South Africa, General Sir Redvers Buller, B.C. As he embarked for the war on the Royal Mail Ship Dunatar Castle, the military bands thundered and the bunting waved. It will be noted from this contemporary illustration that the intrepid general is upright in heavy seas while all about him are aslant. On the 25th of November, 1899, General Buller, the hope of his side, arrived in Natal and uh, moved to his forward headquarters at Frere. And on the very day of his arrival, he moved to a ridge some little way south of Cheveley. I'm standing on that ridge now and uh, looked at Colenso. Now the question that faced uh, General Buller was how to get the British army across the Tugela and uh, through the Boer positions on the ridges and the mountains beyond. He had uh, no maps worth speaking of. The British had been uh, extraordinarily careless in that respect. And one would presume that he would have sent forward scouts and spies to explore the terrain in some detail and uh, to ascertain where the Boers exactly were and how many of them there were. But this he did not do. What did he see in front of him? Well, he saw this great expanse of open country over which his army would have to cross. He saw Colenso, and he knew that immediately behind Colenso was the Tugela, uh, winding violently, but uh, running from west to east, and then the ridges and beyond the mountains. And he quite rightly came to the conclusion that this was an impossible place to make an assault on the Boer positions. So he gave orders that the British army was to move up there, to the west, up to a place called Potgita's Drift, where they could cross the Tugela. Now, it was at this point, to a few acute observers, that they saw a fatal crack in this formidable exterior buller, because no sooner had he given that command than he began to change his mind. He began to worry that uh, an extensive flank march, the idea was that he should get right round there with his army and get behind the Boer positions, that a great flank march like that in front of the Boers uh, and thereby stretching his lines of communication so that they would have to be severed at some point was too risky an operation. So he reissued new orders, and those new orders were that his army was to make a frontal assault on Colenso and the vicinity, something which only 48 hours before he had regarded as being quite rightly out of the question. The date was December the 15th, 1899, the time approximately 5 a.m. 
The Boers made no reply, but the first battle for the relief of Ladysmith had commenced. The British infantry in the centre were to advance over this flat, exposed country. Present was Colonel Long, the same Colonel Long who had sent out the unfortunate armoured train. The Colonel was in command of the artillery that was to support the advancing infantry. He held a belief about the best use of his guns, which he expressed as, uh, the only way to smash those beggars is to rush in at them. And this he proceeded to do. It was later calculated by some dumbfounded observers that he came within 500 yards of the Boer side of the Tugela. The first Boer shot of the battle was fired. But Buller's intense concentration was reserved for General Hart's Irish Brigade on the left flank. Hart was a dangerous soldier, issuing orders that his poor bloody Irishmen were to advance in mass formation, to deploy was un-British. Colonel Command in Dublin instinctively deployed at one point, the order was countermanded by Hart. In this criminal formation, the soldiers were misled into this loop of the river, where they were attacked from three sides. In the ensuing carnage, a young boy, Bugle had done on a personal impulse, sounded the advance. Irishmen piled on Irishmen. Not one man crossed the Tugela and lived. At this place, it was ten feet deep. Buller, horrified, ordered the Irishmen to withdraw as best they could and turned his attention to the sad plight of Long's guns. Ammunition gone, officers and men dead and wounded. Volunteers were called to save these essential symbols. Amongst those who rode forward to their deaths was young Lieutenant Fred Roberts, son of the great Lord Roberts of Kandahar. Buller had seen enough. The bugle sounded the final withdrawal. In a state of suppressed rage, he left the field and sent pessimistic telegrams to England. He asked the Boer leader, General Botha, for an armistice to collect the dead and dying, and Botha, of course, agreed. The British lost half of their total field artillery. General Hart optimistically remarked that he had got all of his Irishmen back. The truth was that about 500 of them were lying shot along the banks of the Tugela. Total British casualties were 1,100 men. Buller continued his pessimistic telegrams with one to General White and Ladysmith. I suggest you're firing away as much ammunition as you can and making best terms you can. From hungry Lady Smith, the sad, withdrawn General White replied with unswerving dignity, will not think of making terms unless I am forced to. The loss of 12,000 men here would be a heavy blow to England. We must not yet think of it. Two days after the battle, Lord Roberts of Kandahar was appointed Commander-in-Chief South Africa, though General Buller was to remain in command in the town. Before leaving England, Lord Roberts was summoned to Windsor to speak with Her Majesty Queen Victoria. The Queen gently asked him about the death of his son, to which Lord Roberts replied, Your Majesty, I cannot speak of that. About anything else, I can speak. Lord Roberts' son, Lieutenant Fred Roberts, was, like his father, though unhappily, posthumously, awarded the V.C. And so were five other soldiers who tried to save the guns at Glenza. In Ladysmith, the siege ploughed on. The British sent up an observation balloon and the Boers aimed at it. Came Christmas and General White shared the meagre festivities. He was heard to remark wanly, I had not realized there were so many children in Ladysmith. Uh, a few years ago, I came across a correspondence of letters uh, written by a Major Robert Bowen of the King's Royal Rifles, who was besieged here in Ladysmith. He was writing back to England. 
And uh, I thought that if I was to read you a few extracts from these letters, you'd get a pretty fair idea what it was like to be a British officer in the Boer War. Uh, the first one is dated the 5th of November, 1899. That's three days after the siege began. It starts, my dearest Missy. Still alive, uh, but we're all getting very tired of this. Perpetually shot at by big guns, nearly every time one comes out to get food, or go around the men, or look through the telescope, one is shot at. Yesterday I had three that I know were men from me, as they were so close. Uh, I tried to shoot the man who does it myself, and made him clear out once. I hope people at home don't think us a laughing stock, being shut up like this. Nothing we should like better than to be led out at them, but I suppose the general knows what is best. If he doesn't, he ought to. Goodbye. Yours ever, R. Bowen. Oh, P.S., P.S. If anything happens to me, you'll hear it as soon as possible, so no news means I'm alive. I suppose it will surprise you to hear that there are lots of nice-looking English women, and a good many have stopped here. Well, I think that was a bit naughty of the Major to write that to his wife back in England, but still, I suppose he had his point of view. Later on, I do trust and hope England will take over the place after this. It will be too wicked if all our lives are to be risked and so many lost for nothing. Well, these hills are the southern defences of Ladysmith. Both born Britain knew that this area was critical. Caesar's camp to the east, and Wagon Hill to the west. If an attack was made, it would probably be made here. This is Wagon Hill that I walked through, the western extremity of the southern defences of Ladysmith. At midnight on January the 5th, 1900, there was a young sentry posted just here by these trees. He belonged to the Imperial Light Horse, and at midnight, he heard, coming from behind Mounted Infantry Hill, that's Mounted Infantry Hill there, which was held by the Boers, he heard, coming across the intervening land, the sound of Boer psalm singing. Uh, now, this wasn't so unusual. The Boers uh, were given to uh, Old Testament habits, but at midnight it was a bit unusual. However, the young sentry decided to let it pass. At quarter to three in the morning, he heard something more sinister. He heard from down there the sound of footsteps. He challenged, and his challenge was answered by a blaze of Mauser fire. Initially, at point-blank range, the Boers were held by volunteers, the Imperial Light Horse. battle exploded across to the east, Caesar's camp. Here the Boers met the Manchester Regiment. The Gordons. And the Rifle Brigade. Sergeant Bosey of the 21st Battery Royal Artillery got an arm and leg shot off. As he was removed from the field, his astounded gunners heard him bellow, Buck up! He was waving his severed arm at them. The heroic Boers edged forward at Wagon Hill. In the emergency, Colonel Hamilton ordered the Devons to drive them off. They hurried through the town, Hamilton asked their Colonel Park if he could do it. The Colonel replied, we will try. An 
icy thunderstorm broke. It was two o'clock in the morning, courage. The colonel said, now then, Devons, get ready. Suffering heavily, they drove the Boers off the hill and Lady Smith was saved. The battle had lasted 16 hours. On the Sunday morning, immediately after the battle, there was a truce. When the British soldiers went up to collect their dead, and the Boers came up the other side to collect theirs. Of course, uh, some of the soldiers were buried where they fell, but others were collected and brought down over these hills to this area here, which until that morning was not a graveyard. Uh, they were laid out, shoulder to shoulder, very often as they fought together, in order of regiment, in order of corps. The soldiers were laid on their backs, and their helmets were cut away from their faces, so that they could be easily identified. Friends and comrades came up to pay their last respects and identify them, and uh, present was a Mr. MacDonald, who was an Australian war correspondent, newspaper correspondent, and he observed a young private of the Manchesters come in. The young private came up and uh, said, um, my young brother uh, is missing, and I hope he isn't amongst this lot. He was in the King's Royal Rifles. Uh, he was pointed out where the King's Royal Rifles lay. They lay along there. And Mr. MacDonald observed him go over and walk along the line of bodies. Suddenly, the private fell to his knees, and Mr. MacDonald went over to give him what comfort he could. The young man looked up and said uh, he was the youngest of us, and I had hoped very much that he would get back to the old people. I don't think that I shall get back myself. These graves were dug by what they call in this country Africans, the Zulus and the Basutos. It is reported that as the bodies were laid in the graves, overhead larks were singing. But above that, vultures were wheeling. Sir George White, the commander of Ladysmith, came up and took off his military hat as he saw his dead soldiers put into the ground. Or someone we know something about. Major Robert S. Bowen, King's Royal Rifles. In his last letter to his wife, written just before he was killed up there on the hill, he commenced it in his customary way. He wrote, Dear Missy. But then he touched on a very personal note, which was normally unlike him. He said that here in Ladysmith, during the siege, he'd had time to think and he asked her to forgive him for being unsympathetic. He sent his love to his sons and remarked that he feared that the eldest would be like him. The last three words that he wrote were very odd indeed. He wrote, goodbye, all right. still decidedly south of the Tugela, was poised for his second attempt. He marshaled his 23,000 soldiers. He swung them 20 miles to the west, through Springfield, to the area known as Spearman's Farm. Here, significantly, 
he ordered a formidable field hospital under the command of the distinguished surgeon, Dr. Frederick Trees. Now, I'm uh, making my way to the top of uh, Mount Alice. Mount Alice lies just in front of Spearman's farm and commands a fantastic view of the Tugela River and beyond that the Boer positions. It was up here that uh, General Buller and his staff came to view the problems that faced them. Incidentally, the Boers at this time were very sadly depleted because of their semi-democratic uh, organization of their army. Uh, many had gone home and uh, it is calculated that at this time there were about 6,000 Boers investing Ladysmith. There were another 6,000 at Colenso. And along here, along this extensive area of the Tugela, which I'm walking up to now, there were no more than 2,000. 2,000 Boers facing 23,000 British soldiers. General Buller got off his horse in complete silence, took a telescope and viewed the Boer positions. He viewed them in complete silence for an hour. He looked down at Potkita's Drift and then looked up at the towering Boer emplacement. And he looked at the two and became very, very gloomy. Buller himself decided that his army could not cross in force at Potkita's Drift. He immediately sent for General Warren and virtually handed the command over to General Warren. He did give uh, instructions to the general. He said you must cross at Trickard's Drift, and he ordered General Warren to cross there and to go round the back of that low mass of mountains called Tabanyama, and so take the Boers in the rear. Just about this time, the dashing uh, Dundonald, Lord Dundonald, had taken some of his cavalry round the back, and there he had ambushed 300 Boers. He killed 25, took 25 prisoner, and there in front of him was the road to Lady Smith Oak. He sent a message back to Warren, he said, look, he said, come quickly, bring the army, we're through to Lady Smith. And Warren was livid. He sent for him and gave him a sound lecture on the uh, duties of cavalry, that they were all right for reconnaissance, but not for winning battles. He actually went so far, General Warren actually went so far as to say, uh, uh, if I don't watch Dundonald, he'll go straight through to Lady Smith. Now, on the 20th, Warren attacked Tabern Yama. He sent up men from Lancashire and men from Yorkshire, and the poor, bloody Irishman under heart. This activity met with some success. They won the southern face of Tabern Yama. But there, because the Boers were so well prepared, though inferior in number, uh, they were held and it was decided to withdraw from Tabanyama. Now, all this time, Buller had been up here as a sort of umpire. He had uh, passed the buck before the action had started, and now Warren came back to him and said, I think that the best thing to do is to go between Tabanyama and this enormous mountain here called Spian Kop. We'll go between the two. Now, this is the first time that the dreadful name of Spian Kopp had been mentioned in terms of anger. Warren said to Buller, and of course I shall have to take Spian Kopp if I do that. And Buller pondered and said, of course you shall have to take Spian Kopp. And they were committed to this British disaster. So likely. And so, 1,700 British soldiers were selected to assault a mountain called Spiankop, 1,740 feet high. These poor men assembled at the base of the spur which runs here to the south on the western corner, and uh, they began their climb. 1,700 soldiers from Lancashire, plus Colonel Thornycroft's mounted infantry, needless to say they were not mounted during the climb, toiled their way to the top of Spian Kopp. They were commanded by General Woodgate, but at the head of the column was Colonel Thornycroft because uh, he knew more about the terrain than anyone else present, not that he knew very much himself. Uh, Colonel Thornycroft, incidentally, was a, an enormous man. He was six feet two inches tall, 
and someone asked him uh, how much to weigh Colonel. And the Colonel replied, uh, with me wire cutters, uh, pencil and map, not an ounce under 20 stone. At the head of the column suddenly appeared a regimental dog, a large white regimental dog, and the young bugler was ordered to take the dog to the bottom of Spian Cop. He was a very fortunate young bugler. The British reached this crest and edged their way across this plateau through the darkness. Dawn began to break and there was a very thick mist. They edged their way through the mist and suddenly a bore voice rang out, Vista! Who goes there? The British replied with their counter signal, Waterloo! The Boers fired, the British fixed bayonets and charged. Only one Boer was bayoneted. The rest of the outpost broke and fled. Forward poured the British and they were on the very top. No Boers would be seen. Spian Kopf was captured. As dawn came, the mist cleared and the full realization hit the British that all was not well. On their forward right flank, they were dominated by an enemy position, and the Boers attacked with Mauser and field gun. General Woodgate was killed. Spian Kopf became a slaughterhouse. Reinforcements were thrown onto the top of Spian Kopf, which was the size of a good English field. By four o'clock in the afternoon on the 24th of January, many shattered British soldiers were making their way back to that spur. But they no longer called it the spur up which they had come, they called it the Ladder of Pain. Working on the Ladder of Pain were stretcher bearers, volunteer stretcher bearers, and uh, the troops referred to them as the body snatchers. Amongst the body snatchers, uh, that reads RIP incidentally, Amongst the body snatchers was a young Indian, later to be known to the world as the Mahatma Gandhi. Riding up the hill, riding, mark you, was the ubiquitous Winston Churchill who come to help people to battle. Later in life, Winston Churchill was to refer to the Mahatma as that uh, half-naked Hekia, probably the most savage and inaccurate statement ever recorded. Down below, uh, Generals Buller and Warren were doing absolutely nothing, as far as one's able to tell. They had thought of no diversionary activities. Uh, General Littleton, probably the best soldier, the best uh, senior soldier present, had on his own back attacked the two eastern peaks over there, the Twin Peaks, which had been of enormous value to the troops up here. Buller, in his abject ignorance, had ordered the withdrawal of Littleton's diversionary activities. Why this was so, it is impossible to tell. And so the four troops up here were back where they started, being pounded right, left, and centre. Winston Churchill, having had a peep at this battle, rode back to uh, General Warren's headquarters and uh, said, ran up to General Warren and said, uh, stop it. Don't let that be another Majuba. Majuba, you'll remember, was the former British defeat in 1881, which hung over British militant patriotism. And uh, Warren, who didn't like being talked to, said, who is this man? Take him away. Have him arrested. Uh, this, uh, this cross here says, to the memory of Corporal A. Pegg, uh, Thornycroft's mounted infantry, died the 24th of January, 1900. Out of all these dead men in here, very few were identified. General Thornycroft, on Spian Kopf, had been informed that he was in command here. Then he was told that he was not in command. 
He asked for confirmation of his position. This confirmation was not given one way or the other. He asked for many things up here in this slaughter place, and they were not given. He revolted against the slaughter of his soldiers, and he decided to evacuate. As he left, he said, better six battalions off the mountain than a mop up in the morning. Out of this tragedy emerged a farce. The British soldiers left the top of Spion Pop, but the Boers were in ignorance of this, and they decided that they had been defeated too, and they left the top of Spion Pop. Therefore, throughout the night of the 24th, 25th of January 1900, there were no soldiers on Spion Pop, except the dead ones and the dying ones. On the following morning, a few brave Boers decided to climb up carefully and look for missing comrades. They found that the mountain was not occupied, and they occupied it. The British lost on Spion Cop 900 dead and wounded, and 300 were taken prisoner. Most of these men, dead and wounded and prisoners, were Lancashire Fusiliers and men of the Royal Lancasters. This reads, Here rest brave soldiers. After the Battle of Spearman Cop, the wounded were brought here to Spearman's Farm to uh, Number 4 Field Stationary Hospital, commanded by Dr. Frederick Treves. And uh, Dr. Treves has recorded some of the terrible things that he saw and heard as the men were brought in. In came a Private Goodman of the King's Royal Rifles. The private Goodman had been hit by a shell fragment taking away his right eye, his right cheek, and the upper part of his mouth. Dr. Treves describes how his tongue was exposed. Private Goodman made signs that he wanted paper and pencil, and these were brought to him. Everyone wondered what he was going to write. Was it, uh, uh, I want water, or uh, am I going to live? And uh, he inscribed the question, did we win? And I don't think that you're going to get much closer to a British soldier in the Boer War than that. Also, uh, at night they had a couple of white lights here to guide the ambulances in. And Dr. Treves also saw one of these ambulances coming in with a soldier who wasn't badly wounded, nursing a comrade who was on the point of death. And he heard the man say as he died, Don't you see nothing yet, Bill? February the 2nd, 
after a gloomy silence, a heliograph message from Buller's army flashed out across the Ladysmith skies. What was it? The garrison must have pressed forward with intense interest. Was it news that Buller at last had found a way to smash through to the relief of the garrison here? They pressed forward and looked at the skies. The message spelt itself out. Sir Stafford Northcote, governor of Bombay, has been made a peer. There must have been many chaps here in Ladysmith at that moment who were prepared to revolt against the British way of life. General Buller himself was now even neurotically depressed, sending pessimistic telegrams to England. But suddenly his mood bounced the other way. He explained his new ideas to General Littleton. The army would swing over to the east and pound through and round the ball left flank. Uh, Littleton remarked afterwards, these ideas appeared so sound that I doubted if they were his own. Up and along these ridges, the men of Lancashire, Ireland and Wales battled. They left behind on this very slope 500 casualties. This bit of Africa is now called Wind Hill, named after General Wynne. Along this road, General Hart and his unbelievably faithful Irishman fought to the hill in front of me. Today remembered as Hart's Hill, here they suffered 450 casualties. Buller was visibly distressed by these losses. It was the old pattern again and again, military failure leading to personal grief. Now he was a very desperate man. By February the 25th, so many wounded lay out in the open that a truce was agreed. On that day, on these cruel hillsides, there was much fraternising between Boer and Britain. A Boer commandant named Pretorius sympathetically addressed General Littleton on the battlefield. You British have had a rough time. A rough time, replied Littleton. I suppose so, but we are used to it and we are all well paid for it. Great God, said the Boer. Of course, Littleton was not telling the whole truth. Many of the soldiers were not used to it, and most of them were appallingly paid. One shilling per day, before deductions for doing the dying. The general must have temporarily forgotten his name. On February the 27th, 1900, for the first time in this war, the British Army hit with everything it had. 76 guns thundered. And men of the Scots, Irish and Dublin Fusiliers, men of the West Yorks and the Rifle Brigade, and the East Surreys fixed bayonets and attacked. It was Majuba Day. Vengeance Day for the British Army. A war correspondent wrote, I never saw infantry strain at the leash as they strained that day. It was impossible for those brave soldier farmers to hold. The British were in amongst them. War losses were heavy. One section from their capital of Pretoria lost every single man, either killed or prisoner. A Boer who saw it said, their going at this calamitous time was scarcely noticed. Another Boer named Van Warmelo wrote, the two republics being forced to venture on war against a powerful kingdom felt themselves staggering under the heavy blow. It was all over. And Buller was back in bottom gear. He forbade pursuit. My job is to relieve Ladysmith, and anywhere the tricking boars are difficult to catch. British cavalry at the end of that day were enraged. Early in the morning on February the 28th, the besieged garrison saw the boars fleeing to the north away from the Tugela. Uh, just after tea time, the tottering, starved inhabitants of Ladysmith went wild. Riding up from the south, along this high street, 
and past this Anglican church came a squadron of mounted infantry. They were not Ladysmith horses, they were too well fed. At the head was a Captain Goff, who was later to command an army corps in France. He was joined by one of his troopers. Uh, they had been at Eton together, and the trooper said to the captain, an Eton boy must be first to enter Ladysmith. Soon, uh, behind them, another column appeared, and at their head was Colonel the Lord Dundonald, and, of course, with him was Winston Churchill. Now, this column was challenged. Who goes there? The Ladysmith Relief Column. Pass the Ladysmith Relief Column. Soldiers in ragged uniforms came out from their emplacements, their sangers and their gun pits, and did their best to cheer. One of Lord Dundonald's staff uh, failed to hide his emotions when he saw the state of the men who tried to stand to attention. He openly wept. General Sir George White appeared and made a short speech. He ended his speech with the words, I thank God that we have kept the flag flying. <laughs>